Next speakers are Anna Mestrovic and Maden Vernezir. Anna Mestrovic is full professor at the University of Rijeka. He has a Bachelor of Science degree in Mathematics and Informatics at the University of Rijeka, Master of Science and PhD studies in Information Science at the University of Zagreb. He, uh, her expertise is in NLP, semantic technologies, knowledge representation, complex networks, social network analysis. On the other side, Maden Fernagir is a lead data scientist and co-founder of Elabit AI, with many years of professional experience in research and development of products based on deep learning and other machine learning uh, approaches. Mladen works on research and development of models in the fields of computer vision, NLP, uh, and dynamics systems modeling. He took part in many international conferences and one of the authors of the patent application related to visual simulation. Their topic for today is experience in collaboration between academia and industry, NLP solutions for infodemic management. With her, with Anna's background in academia, Anna Mestrovic will describe the experience of collaboration with Mladen Fernagir from Velebit AI. In her talk, Anna will present research ideas and the results of the project multi-layer framework for the information spreading categorization in social media during the COVID-19. Uh, founded by the Croatian Science Foundation and explain how they apply NLP methods in the task of information monitoring, while Mladen will share technical details of the implementation. Mladen and Anna, can you come on the stage? Hello, everybody. Okay, uh, I'm very happy for having opportunity to present our research at this conference. Uh, so uh, this talk is about how NLP can help us uh, in infodemic management. And uh, as um, said, uh, I will also share my experience in collaboration with uh, Mladen uh, from Velabit AI. And Mladen will uh, then uh, tell you some technical details about his implementation. Uh, so this project uh, was funded by the Creation Science Foundation and now it's over. It lasted for 18 months. And I have to say that usually these scientific projects last for uh, four or five years. And this way uh, scientists uh, have enough time to explore and to propose some new solutions, new methods and new algorithms for a given project. And uh, in industry is, uh, I think, different because uh, they have a short time to realize, uh, uh, to finish the projects. Uh, and uh, this time uh, it was different because it was a pandemic and we need to react more quickly. And that is why we ask help from industry uh, experts. And uh, this was a kind of a plot twist because usually experts from academia help uh, in some uh, industry project with some specific uh, problems. Uh, and this time the, this knowledge transfer goes from uh, industry to academia. And in my experience, uh, it is a great opportunity to learn uh, new things. So I think that this knowledge transfer should always go uh, in both directions. So this project was focused on uh, so-called information monitoring, which is one of the four pillars of infodemic management. And in our case, we were focused on the analysis of COVID-related text published in social media. So maybe it's now uh, not so attractive to speak about uh, COVID and coronavirus, but uh, these ideas and methodologies that we implemented can be helpful for any similar task of some kind of infodemic monitoring or in general in a uh, social network and social media monitoring. And in our research, we uh, used uh, natural language processing and social network analysis methods. So the main question is, uh, can AI help us in infodemic management? And um, my answer is definitely yes, because um, infodemic is about large amount of textual data sets, which human can hardly process in a short time, while machines can. 
and we have available a lot of machine learning algorithms, neural networks, deep learning, which can help us in uh, processing large amounts of data and solve these uh, different NLP tasks uh, like keyword extraction, topic modeling, name entity recognition, and some kind of text classification like sentiment analysis uh, or fake news spreading. Uh, in our uh, project, uh, we used all these tasks except fake news spreading because this was the hardest one and this is the part of our future uh, research. And we also combined some methods from social network analysis. We analyzed the spreading of uh, information and some dynamics. But uh, in this talk, we will be focused uh, mainly on the tasks uh, related to NLP. So in the first part of um, our um, project. Uh, we were focused on data collection. We collect large amount of COVID-related texts from online um, media in creation language and also from social networks like Twitter, YouTube uh, and Reddit. And then we constructed these uh, data sets. Uh, the sizes are now even larger. This was the size uh, after first year of uh, our uh, research. And most of these data sets are uh, publicly available at our website so it can be for used for, for some further researches. And uh, one of a uh, very important task of uh, our research was to implement this language model for text representation and some um, uh, classification models. And this was a task of Velabit AI. So Mladen will explain you more details about these models. So first we choose a BERT model, trilingual BERT, which was pre-trained for Croatian, Slovene and English language. And we additionally uh, train this model on uh, COVID-related text uh, to cover this new COVID-related terminology. And then uh, in the next step, we um, fine-tune this model for the task of sentiment classification. For this task, we prepared uh, 10,000 uh, manually annotated tweets with uh, labels of uh, sentiment polarity in terms of positive, negative or neutral attitudes uh, in tweets. And in the last step, we try with some uh, retweet prediction. And for that task, we uh, was actually, we wanted to um, integrate knowledge from different sources, uh, text and social networks. But this is only in a preliminary stage and it's part also of our future work. So uh, now I'm going to um, share uh, some selected project results. We had a lot of results. We published more than 10 scientific papers. But here I selected a few interesting results to show you how even very simple NLP methods can give you an overview into infodemic and into this uh, crisis com communication on social media. So in one of our studies, we analyzed uh, COVID-related text published um, in online news portals during the first 13 months of the pandemic, which actually covers the first two uh, waves of the pandemic. And uh, the amount of these, these articles were large. There were 45% of uh, COVID-related uh, articles, and some portals published even more than 60% of uh, these articles, uh, which suggests that we really had an infodemic at that uh, period. And uh, then we analyzed uh, the most frequent terms and pandemic-related terminology and wanted to see if there were some changes in these um, main, most frequent terms during the 13 months of the pandemic. And as you see on this heat map, we measured the uh, um, um, overlap uh, using Jacquard index, and this overlap in the most frequent terminology was really high, especially during the summer of 2020, where we actually did not have a lot of COVID cases, but the media continued to write about COVID, and they were nothing to write about, so that is why they, um, we have this large overlap, because they're using the same terminology all, all the time. And on this uh, second graph, you can see how the terminology changes from this related to symptoms and hygiene and drugs uh, to the uh, vaccines in the second wave. And in the uh, last, uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the second step, we, we performed name entity recognition. 
And uh, then we again measured the similarity across months between the most frequent institutions, uh, locations, and persons, which were, mentions in the, which were mentioned in those uh, texts. And uh, we indicated that we again have high overlap uh, uh, for institutions and for locations, while for persons the overlap was not so high, so it seems that media write about different persons uh, across this uh, the first uh, 13 months of the pandemic. And uh, below on this, uh, on this word clause, you can see that um, uh, many politicians and political parties were mentioned in those texts, which uh, suggest that um, this pandemic-related uh, narrative was influenced by politics, which we already know, but now we quantify that. And uh, these are results of topic modeling. I'm not going into any details, but we used LDA um, uh, method and uh, extracted the seven uh, topics. Um, again, you can get a really comprehensive overview of these topics which were used in this uh, text. And in another study, we analyzed uh, Twitter and uh, we collected more than 200,000 uh, COVID-related tweets. Uh, and for that, we implement this um, uh, complex uh, pipeline for collecting tweets and then for uh, representing tweets by using word model. And then we perform sentiment analysis and, and um, clustering of tweets. And then uh, the results of sentiment analysis showed that almost 50% of tweets were negative. So here we uh, show on this graph the negativity of tweets. Uh, it seems that in the first wave we have a lot of negativity, then during the summer tweets were non-negative. Then again during the winter we have negativity. And again in the May of 2020 uh, the, the negativity decreased which is again very, um, it, it makes sense, we expected that, but now we can see that by using only 10,000 uh, annotated tweets, we can actually have results uh, for more than 200 uh, tweets. And uh, the results of clustering shows this uh, thematic, um, the, the amount of different tweets across topics. Uh, we used Cummings algorithm to, uh, uh, to cluster these tweets into 10 different clusters, and then we identify a topic of each cluster. And we wanted to see which cluster is the largest one and if we have some changes across the uh, first three waves of the pandemic. And uh, the largest cluster belongs to a topic that, uh, dedicated to the um, discussion about anti-pandemic measure measures and vaccines with almost 30% of tweets. Then the second largest cluster belongs to the topic of um, uh, how to cope with uh, pandemic. And this cluster is interesting because at the beginning it has uh, more than 26% of tweets, while in the last, in the third wave, it has only 13% of tweets, um, which also have sense because at the beginning we were talking about that, how to cope with the pandemic later, nah, not. Uh, and but while other clusters uh, did not have these substantial changes in uh, the size of tweets and the amount of tweets. Uh, then further we analyzed uh, neg uh, the sentiment across cluster and the sharing of uh, tweets uh, across clusters in terms of retweeting. Uh, I can only say that um, the most negative clusters were uh, related to this uh, discussion of anti-pandemic measures, vaccines, and some uh, revolt of citizens. And non-negative clusters were uh, related to uh, some kind of informative measures related to corona. These are with this neutral ad, uh, uh, label. And positive uh, cluster is related to this uh, how to cope with the pandemic. Because at the beginning, people were actually um, positive in that uh, um, and, and try to help each other uh, and uh, explain how to cope with the pandemic. Uh, so we do not have a lot of time, so I will uh, stop here with explaining these results, but we have a lot of other results and uh, you can really see that actually uh, basic NLP methods can give us this overview of the pandemic-related communication, but this and similar methods can be applied in also some similar tasks in different 
crisis and maybe in some future gl global crisis and so on. And uh, to finish my part, I would like to uh, represent my team. Half of them uh, are here. So this is Sanda Martinci-Cipsic, <laughs> who is uh, actually uh, connect us with this conference. Uh, our um, postdoc, Slobodan Beliga, and doctoral student, uh, Milan uh, Petrovic. <laughs> And um, I have to say that actually, yes, yesterday uh, at this conference, I meet um, Mladen uh, in real life because uh, during the, this pandemic, we were totally online. And one important thing, uh, how we met Mladen, uh, we met Mladen because Sanda went uh, at this conference five years ago in Belgrade, and then she, she met uh, NS Demich, who is also here, and he was our connection to Mladen. So this conference is a good um, uh, opportunity for networking. <laughs> okay, and now I'm finished with my part, so I give the stage to the Mladen here. Uh, thank you, Anna. Uh, okay, so I'll speak um, about some implementation details that I did um, as a part of Velvet so, AI for this uh, project. NLP classification so, in general, uh, uh, it's a common about, problem, um, yet uh, sentiment still there could be difficulties um, in practice and also when about doing it. retweeting And like uh, Anna said, uh, typically what people do, they use um, readily available language models. Uh, so this is also something that we did here because you need a lot of data to uh, get that basic language model. And um, as a next step, uh, optionally, um, uh, people uh, do um, fine tuning on unlabeled data. So this is also something that we did here. So we had uh, unlabeled COVID related data. And this is something that we used for additional fine tuning of that uh, initial model. And lastly, the, the thing that you will always do, you will fine tune uh, to your label data. So in this case, uh, we had a sentiment classification uh, at, at the first part. Um, okay, so uh, here we can see what were the uh, basic uh, models uh, that we used here. So uh, the first one was this model uh, trained as a part of the Embedia uh, project. Uh, it was trained on Croatian, Slovene, and English. And the second model, uh, it's called Bertic. It's a, it's, it is a more recent model. It's more close to Croatian, as, as you can see, that it was trained on Bosnian, Croatian, uh, Montenegrin, and Ser uh, Serbian. And this one is a bit different. That's also one aspect. So the, the first model, the Embedium one, it's a BERT model. And the second one, it's uh, Electra-based model. So this one is uh, more efficient and it turned out uh, to be better in this case. Um, OK, so another point here worthwhile mentioning when you're doing uh, fine tuning is always uh, good to have in mind what's your end goal. So here, for example, it was good to prepare this data for fine tuning in a way that it's similar to the end task and which, which is uh, Twitter classification. So here we also had this aspect of uh, oversampling user comments in the unlabeled data because this is more similar to tweets. So we were training on portal data uh, from various sources and it was useful to oversample uh, user comments when training this uh, uh, part of uh, the process. Uh, I will briefly explain some, some technicalities here uh, regarding uh, Electra uh, model training. So this one is a bit better than the BERT model. So just briefly, uh, the BERT model, the Embedia one, uh, it just uses this uh, first part, uh, which is uh, called mask language modeling. Uh, while the Electra model also has this part uh, with the discriminator. So I'll just briefly explain the idea here, what, what's, uh, what's the uh, approach, how to train this. Um, so we have some inputs, so we don't have any labels. We have uh, free text like this one, the chef um, cooked the meal. And then uh, what you do uh, initially, this is the same for the BERT model and also for the Electra one you put some masks. So you mask some words like D or cooked, it's masked here, and then uh, you have this part of the model, it's called mask language modeling, where you have to predict what was the original word. And here, okay, we see that the model got the word D right, 
but for example, we see that uh, there was a miss for the cooked. So it actually predicted uh, word eight here at this point. So this part is the same, the generator part, uh, mask language modeling, uh, but what the Electra does additionally, it has this discriminator part which has to tell, okay, whether the generator actually generated the correct, correct word. So we can see, okay, D was correctly pr predicted by the generator, and that's something the discriminator uh, says, while for this case, eight, uh, it was replaced and the, the, and the generator didn't get it right. So what happens here uh, when you do the final part of fine tuning on your uh, target classification task where, where you use label data, uh, you just take the discriminator part. So this works in that way. So you just uh, discard the generator part, you just use it here as a step to get the better discriminator, and you actually just fine tune the discriminator part to get the final classification. While for the BERT model, you would just have this generator part with no discriminator. So, so that's the basic uh, difference there. Um, okay, so just briefly uh, uh, regarding this problem. So we have uh, creation tweets um, related to COVID. Uh, this is a classification problem. We have uh, three separate classes. And what we can see here, uh, it's important. We have a great disbalance like Anna mentioned. Uh, we have just uh, 475 examples of positive data, so roughly 10 times less data. And this is a generally a difficulty when you're doing uh, classification problems. Uh, class, uh, class disbalance never helps, so that's one of the challenges. And of course, this is not a lot of data uh, to train models, so uh, typically what's, a, what's the problem there? Well, you get overfitting, so that's something that often happens. And what this means, you can see it here on this uh, validation graph where you're checking losses, you want to have losses going down, but when you get overfitting, at some point when you train for, for longer, you're getting uh, this uh, increase in the losses. So that's uh, the challenge that you want to solve. Uh, you don't want overfitting. And uh, like I said, uh, this becomes difficult when you have uh, low amounts of data and also class disbalance is, is bad for that uh, class, which is the least represented one. So the performance was of course the worst for this class, uh, which had the least data. Um, okay, so uh, some common approaches, uh, how to approach overfitting, well, uh, like in other machine learning projects, you can, you can do minority class oversampling. Uh, you can also use different class loss weights. Uh, techniques from neural network training. Um, dropout is a common technique for uh, regularization. L2 regularization, also common for machine learning models. Uh, also techniques uh, uh, that use uh, freezing some model parameters. So you, you can freeze some of the uh, parameters in your transformer model and then effectively you get a model which is not so complex and it's a smaller model and smaller models are better when you're dealing with overfitting. Uh, early stopping, you just stop training earlier like we saw previously, uh, you can stop earlier when your validation loss is low enough and you don't continue training. And also you could do NLP data augmentation so that's also something that uh, could uh, be helpful for uh, tackling overfitting. Uh, one detail that I want to share as well, uh, people uh, usually when they do uh, different class loss weights, uh, they just uh, pick three weights in this case because we have three classes. But what I found out here, uh, it actually helped to have a matrix of weights, so depending on your uh, ground truth and the predicted value. So depending on the combination, it was helpful to pick the weights in this way, so uh, this helped to improve the performance, especially for the least represented positive class. Um, okay, so here uh, briefly I will mention about the retweet uh, classification project. So here, uh, as, a simplicit, uh, as a simplified approach, um, we are just checking those uh, uh, tweets which uh, have been retweeted. And also um, we, we see here th that we actually posed it as a categorization problem just to make it simpler as, a, as an initial step. So we have class zero retweeted only once and also uh, one uh, tweets that were retweeted more than once. And what we are re really looking into here, so what's the main uh, research uh, 
project here in, in, in the infoco project. So it's not their classification itself, uh, but they were mainly interested in uh, how different features uh, influence the categorization. So uh, we had some features which were just extracted from this uh, fine-tuned um, language model. So that's the first part that I mentioned where we fine-tuned uh, on unlabeled data. You can just uh, extract features from there. So that's one part. But in the project, they also had additional features uh, which were related to how users behave on the Twitter network. So, so some tabular features, but also mostly numerical features that were uh, used here. And then, okay, we can join all together. And the idea is to check how those different features and approaches influence the end task. And we checked uh, different uh, algorithms uh, to see that. So uh, here are the listed algorithms that I tried for this project. So basic uh, um, fully connected network, MLP, random forests, light GBN, and those two uh, uh, models, uh, I mentioned the references here. So node model and tabnet, that's also something that I wanted to try here. And the, the model in the end category bendings and MLP, uh, it's a si simple variation. Uh, where f some category, where categorically, uh, where categorical um, variables, they get their embeddings, and then we just have some fully connected layers in the end. So the reason why I wanted to try these models, uh, th those models here, is that um, this is something that's currently active as a research question: whether you could beat light GBN on, ta on tabular data. And those two papers are challenging that. They're saying that on some data sets they are winning. And it, of course, in the end, like you know, uh, it will depend on the data. In this problem, uh, we didn't actually have many categorical features. They were rather simpler. And actually, this, this model was slightly better than, than the others. But all of them are quite similar. So here, we didn't have this big edge that LightGBN would normally have. When you, when you have uh, more complex categorical features, then you would expect this one would win. I also checked those papers just to see whether they might win, as they say, in, in, in their uh, respective papers. So uh, you, can, you can find everything on GitHub. So you can see the results uh, and all the models there. And I'll just briefly mention another thing that was uh, quite useful for this project. Um, it's Optuna hyperparameter optimization. So that's a tool uh, that enables you to pick optimal parameters. You can see, okay, by the number of trials, how your objective function, which is the F1 score, varies depending on the pick. This is a popular library many data scientists use, and it's also used on uh, many data science challenges. Here you can also see in the end which hyperparameter uh, was more important. So uh, that's also ra rather useful so that you can see how uh, we, uh, each parameter helped. And I'll just end it here with a list of useful libraries because we are running out of time. And uh, of course, if you have some questions, uh, we'll be happy to answer. So we, you, you can catch us in the coffee break for any questions. Thank you. Uh, Madden, oh. <laughs> it was from our conference.